Thank you, Claire, and good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? To my Armenian brothers and sisters, Parev Yev Pari Yedago, thank you all for joining us for this beautiful ceremony this evening. And a special thank you to our dinner committee and my co-chairs, John and Sudan, for all their hard work in planning and organizing this event. Thank you, yes. Thank you. I want to give a special shout out to my uh, colleagues. We have several U.S. attorneys here. It's great of you to join us. My colleagues from the Obama administration, former U.S. attorneys from as far away as Northern California and the Dakotas, Arkansas and Colorado, and as near as New York and Rhode Island. It's great to see you all, and it's a tribute to our two honorees tonight that you would take time to join us. To my friend Bob Tembekshin, I just want to say, uh, we're very proud of you. You paid me a special visit early in my tenure as U.S. Attorney. I won't forget it. You shared stories uh, uh, of our similar paths as Armenian descendants of Armenian immigrants who went on to impactful careers in public service. I want to say congratulations to you. Your career defines selfless and steady public service. Of course, my primary role tonight is to introduce my friend, Rod Rosenstein, the 37th Deputy Attorney General of the United States. And I know the burning question on everybody's mind is, where is the IAN or YAN in Rosenstein? <laughs> so being a former federal prosecutor myself, I thought I'd dig a little deeper into Rod's background and try to answer that question and give you a better sense of and a better picture of who this man is that we've heard so much about over the past two years. First, Rod's pedigree is simply extraordinary. He was born in Philadelphia in January of 1965, earned his college degree from the Wharton School at UPenn, where he graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor of Science degree. Something that is not so well known that's where Rod first got his nickname, Mr. Peepers, <laughs> Report, reportedly by a lab partner in his molecular biology class. It's also the reason, of course, that Rod, who is a history scholar who frequently invokes the words of our founding fathers, John Adams, Ben Franklin, as well as oratorical giants like Winston Churchill, sometimes falls back into quoting and comparing himself to Philadelphia's favorite son, Rocky Balboa who could take a punch and come back for more again and again and again and again. <laughs> Little did Rod know how, how many similarities he had with Rocky. Um, after Wharton, Rod went on to attend Harvard Law School. He was the editor of the Law Review there, graduated cum laude. Less well known is the fact that while at Harvard, he interned for then acting U.S. Attorney Robert Mueller who would later himself go on to serve as Deputy Attorney General and Director of the FBI. And Rod has spoken frequently about how that internship changed the course of his career and probably didn't know that their paths would intersect again. So it began at that time, Rod's extraordinary 30-year career of public service in the administration of presidents of both parties. Rod served as a law clerk for a judge in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and joined the Department of Justice uh, through the Honors Program. By my count, he served in six different uh, positions with DOJ, including as trial attorney with the Public Integrity Section, counsel to the Deputy Attorney General, Special Assistant Criminal Division AAG, Associate Independent Counsel for the Whitewater Investigation, an AUSA in Maryland, and Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Tax Division. And then in 2005, President George W. Bush appointed him the United States Attorney for the District of Maryland. And he was reappointed by President Obama, one of only three Republican United States attorneys to, who were asked to stay on. And he served with distinction throughout two terms of the Obama administration, with many of us who are here in the room and continue that in that post until he was appointed to his uh, current position as Deputy Attorney General by President Trump. So all of these achievements, they're remarkable, no doubt about it, but it's clear that his most important success was his decision to marry 
the wonderful Lisa Barsoomian, a very accomplished American lawyer herself. and a former officer in this organization over 20 years ago. For those of you who don't know Lisa, because Rod kind of takes all the air out of the room, she is herself an outstanding lawyer, having clerked for a federal district judge in LA and served as an AUSA in the District of Columbia U.S. Attorney's Office, as well as Deputy Associate General Counsel for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Together, they have two daughters, Julie, a college freshman, and Allie, a high school junior. Like their parents, the girls are high achievers. Over the years, Lisa has taught Rod what it means to be Armenian. From their wedding day in 1995, when Lisa's cousin, Mauro Partamian, currently a soloist at St. Barton Cathedral here in New York, and a guest with us tonight, sang a beautiful Armenian wedding song. To the impactful trip to Armenia that Lisa and Rod took, with the Armenian Bar Association, to the many festivals and bazaars at Armenian churches like the St. Mary Armenian Church in Washington, D.C., where Rod became enamored with Mazunov Kifte, Manta, Choreg, and Yalanche. <laughs> he was heard to say, Shat Homava, how wonderful, how delicious. <laughs> to their recent visit with Ambassador Nersession and his wife Noreen at the French Embassy, during a musical tribute, Rod has come to know and love the beauty and strength of our Armenian heritage. Thankfully, strength is a quality that shines brightly in Rod and is described in a speech given by one of Rod's most admired leaders, Winston Churchill in 1941. Describing the difficult times that the United Kingdom had endured during the early years of World War II as Hitler's army marched on Europe, Churchill said this, Never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Throughout his entire career, and especially during his tenure as Deputy Attorney General, Rod has lived by those words and demonstrated commitment to doing the right thing in the right way to secure justice for all. He has been a steady hand during a tumultuous time, and he has displayed the grit, the grace, and the resolve under fire sometimes seemingly from all sides, that would have made Churchill proud. So it is with thanks to Lisa that we honor Rod for a lifetime of service to the cause of justice for Armenian Americans and for all people. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Rod Rosenstein. Thank you very much. Perry Irigor. Good evening. It's 9.30. I know this event was scheduled to end at 9.30, but this is an Armenian event. We're just getting started. <laughs> Many of you I already knew. Some of you I had the opportunity to meet during the reception. And there were a couple of comments that uh, people made to me repeatedly. One was people commented that I'm taller in person than I look on TV. <laughs> and I explain that's because you keep seeing that clip of me sitting at a table in a congressional hearing. <laughs> Another was that I'm better looking in person. I wasn't quite sure what to make of that one. <laughs> but I'm very grateful to Rick Cartoonian, who's a, a good friend. And Rick, I appreciate your service, 20 years of service in the federal government, seven years as United States Attorney. I'm also pleased to see several of our current U.S. attorneys from New York who are here today. We have Jeff Berman from Southern New York, Rick Donahue from Eastern New York, Grant Jaquith from Northern New York. We have an empty seat for Craig Carpenito from New Jersey, who's actually in trial. That's a good excuse, as far as I'm concerned, for not being here tonight. I'm also very grateful, as Rick mentioned, to see some of my former colleagues. Several former U.S. attorneys are here as well. I also want to thank the Armenian Bar Association Chair, Gerard Kasabian, and Vice Chairs, Catherine Ossian and Lucy Varpedian. There were a couple of people who commented to me at the reception uh, that I need to stay in my job. And I said, for how long? <laughs> the mean tenure of a Deputy Attorney General is 16 months. 
I've been in the job for two years. This is my two-year anniversary, and not too many have lasted longer than two years. But it has been a privilege for me every day uh, to serve in this job, and a particular privilege for me to celebrate my two-year anniversary here with you. My wife served, as Rick mentioned, on the Board of Governors of the Armenian Bar Association from 1993 to 2002. I got to know many of your members, particularly a group who traveled with us to Armenia in 1994 to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the University of Yerevan. Some of you I haven't seen since then, others we've kept in touch with over the years. When I met Lisa in 1988, some of her relatives viewed me as Odar, <laughs> a stranger to the culture. But recently, a friend introduced me as Armenian by choice, and it was repeated here this morning, so this afternoon, so I'm really happy about that. I now have, thanks to you, an even stronger claim that I can tell Lisa's relatives that I am, in fact, an honorary Armenian. I'll show them the plaque. <laughs> so, Shot Chanora Gala. Thank you very much for that. Well, Rick mentioned that our wedding featured an Armenian opera singer, Maro Partamian, who is known to many of you. Maro, where are you? Aha, uh -huh, thank you. Maro uh, sang at our wedding, as Rick mentioned. She also produced an album of Armenian music. And Lisa was surprised that I remember this because it was an old-fashioned record that we used to play in the old days. Remember how music used to come on these black discs? And one of my favorites of her songs was a song called Lerner Hyreni, Mountains of Armenia. We hired, in addition at our wedding, we hired the Dark Eyes Band. Anybody from LA familiar with the Dark Eyes Band? Uh, they were great, except I chose a country song by John Michael Montgomery called I Swear for our first dance. And it just didn't sound right with the Armenian accent. <laughs> One of Lisa's relatives was raised in Syria, where government service is not highly valued. And before he approved of our marriage, he wanted to know when I planned to get a real job in the private sector. <laughs> Unfortunately, many native-born Americans are also skeptical about government service. My uncle, Harold, was a self-employed carpenter, a carpet installer. And one beautiful spring day in 1994, I called him from my office at the Department of Justice headquarters in Washington. It was a Saturday, and when I told him I was working through the weekend, he said, I'm sorry to hear that. And I said, you don't understand. There is no place that I would rather be than here at the Department of Justice. That is how I felt then, that's how I felt now. When I first woke, walked into that building on December 3rd of 1990, it was a great privilege for me to represent the people of the United States. I will still feel that way when I walk out of that building for the last time next month. I joined the Department of Justice because I believe in the mission. I have stayed because I believe in the people who carry out the mission, many of whom are here today. Our agents, analysts, and attorneys demonstrate great intellect and integrity. They possess superb academic credentials and exceptional character. They pass rigorous screening interviews and face thorough background checks every few years. They are ethical, honorable, and admirable people. But no organization with 115,000 employees is error-free. Nonetheless, we have serious professional internal watchdogs. We investigate credible allegations of wrongdoing, and we punish mistakes. We punish wrongdoers, and we correct mistakes. I have served under five presidents and nine Senate-confirmed attorneys general, 10 if you count Bill Barr twice. I've been there for a long time. I served mostly outside the D.C. Beltway, but I worked at the department's headquarters three times, four years in the early 1990s as a prosecutor, four years in the early 2000s as a supervisor, and two years in my current job. Our headquarters, some of you have been there, it's a beautiful Depression-era building. I frequently speak about the inspiration that I draw from three aspects of that building, the art that it contains, the people it employs, and the principles that it represents. There are reminders when I walk through that building of heroes, mentors, and friends on every floor. They taught me that our department stands for the proposition that every American deserves the protection of the rule of law. Now, many of you are lawyers. You know that we use the term rule of law to describe our obligation to follow neutral principles. As the president pointed out in his law day remarks last year, 
we govern ourselves in accordance with the rule of law rather than the whims of an elite few or the dictates of collective will. Justice Anthony Kennedy explained it this way. He said, in a rule of law system, when you apply to a government clerk for a permit and you satisfy the objective criteria, you're not asking for a favor. You are entitled to the permit, and the clerk has a duty to give it to you. That idea that government works for the people, it's relatively novel in human history. In some countries, the concept of a government bound by law to serve the people does not exist. And when I visited Armenia in 1994, the nation was just emerging from seven decades of Soviet domination. And some of you remember that time. Gumri and other northern cities were not yet rebuilt after the 1988 earthquake. The six-year war with Azerbaijan was halted by a recent ceasefire, but the blockade over Nagorno-Karabakh had devastated the Armenian economy. We flew in on Air Armenia, which was a shabby old Russian jet. And those of you who were with us at the time probably remember that well. Our plane needed to stop for fuel in Bulgaria because they didn't have enough jet fuel, fuel in Armenia. And we heard that the pilots paid for it with a suitcase full of cash. Now we prosecutors get suspicious when we see that kind of thing. So there is, Armenia faced many challenges in 1994. Many skilled and educated people had left the country. When we hired a taxi, to visit Lake Sivan. The driver turned off the engine on every downhill stretch to serve gasoline. I had never seen that before or since. In fact, Vikan Simonian, who many of you know, was with us on that trip. I remember that well. We stayed at a nice hotel near Republic Square. But some mornings, there was no water to flush the toilets. And some evenings, there was no electricity to cook the food. I gave a lecture at the University of Yerevan. My subject was public corruption. When I finished, a student raised his hand. He asked me, if you can't pay bribes in America, how do you get electricity there? <laughs> now, I've repeated that question in many speeches. It usually elicits laughter. But the point, I think, is very profound. Because that question illustrates how that young man understood Soviet society. Corruption like that undermines law. It stifles innovation. It creates inefficiency and it inculcates distrust. And that question, in a way, explains why I devoted my career to law enforcement. Because the rule of law is the foundation of human liberty. The rule of law secures our freedom. It will secure our children's freedom. And we can only achieve it if people who enforce the law set aside partisanship. Because the rule of law requires a fair and independent process, a process where all citizens are equal in the eyes of the government. I do not care how police officers, prosecutors, and judges vote, just as I don't care how soldiers and sailors vote. That's none of my business. I only care whether they understand that when they're on duty, their job is law and not politics. There is not Republican justice and Democrat justice. There's only justice and injustice. In our Department of Justice headquarters, there's an inscription that reads, privilegium obligatio. It means that when you accept a privilege, you incur an obligation. Incidentally, that's Latin, not Armenian, for those of you who didn't translate it. <laughs> Working for the Justice Department is a privilege, and our commensurate obligation is established by our oath to well and faithfully execute the duties of the office. So to honor that oath, you need to understand the unique duties of your particular office. At our department, our job is to seek the truth, apply the law, follow the department's policies, and respect its principles. The rule of law is our most important principle. Patriots must always defend the rule of law, even when it's not in their personal interest. It is always in the national interest. If you find yourself asking, what will this decision mean for me, then you're probably not complying with your oath of office. At my confirmation hearing, in March of 2017, a Republican senator asked me to make a commitment. He said, you're going to be in charge of this Russia investigation. I want you to look me in the eye and tell me that you'll do it right, that you'll take it to its conclusion, and you will report your results to the American people. Now, I did pledge to do it right and to take it to the appropriate conclusion. I did not promise to report all results to the public because, as my fellow U.S. attorneys know well, grand jury investigations are ex parte proceedings. It's not our job to render conclusive factual findings. 
We just decide whether it's appropriate to file criminal charges. That is our job. Now, some critical decisions about that Russia investigation were made before I got there. The previous administration chose not to publicize the full story about Russian computer hackers and social media trolls and how they relate to Russia's broader strategy to undermine America. The FBI disclosed classified information about that investigation to selected lawmakers and their staffers. Someone selectively leaked information to the news media. The FBI director disclosed at a congressional hearing that there was a counterintelligence investigation that might result in criminal charges. And then the former FBI director alleged that the president had pressured him to close the investigation. And the president denied that that conversation occurred. So that happened. <laughs> There's a story about firefighters who arrive at the scene of a fire and they find a man on a burning bed. And when they ask him how the fire started, he says, I don't know. It was on fire when I lay down on it. I know the feeling. <laughs> but the bottom line is that there was overwhelming evidence that Russian operatives had hacked American computers and defrauded American citizens. And that is only the tip of the iceberg of a comprehensive Russian strategy to influence elections, promote social discord, and undermine America, just like they do in many Eastern European countries. In 1941, as Hitler sought to enslave Europe and Japan's emperor prepared to attack America, Attorney General Robert Jackson admonished federal prosecutors about their role in protecting national security. He said, defense is not only a matter of battleships and tanks, of guns and soldiers, it's raw materials, machines, and people who work in factories. It is public morale. It is a law-abiding population and a nation free from internal disorder. The ramparts that we watch are not only those on the outer borders, which are largely the concern of the military, there are also inner ramparts of our society, the Constitution, its guarantees, our freedoms, and the supremacy of law these are yours to guard, and their protection is your defense program. So in 2017, as acting Attorney General of the United States, it was my responsibility to make sure that the Department of Justice would do what the American people pay us to do, conduct an independent investigation, complete it expeditiously, hold perpetrators accountable if it is warranted by the evidence, and work with our partner agencies to counter foreign agents and to deter crimes. That's what we do. Today, I believe our nation is safer, elections are more secure, and certainly citizens are better informed about covert foreign influence operations. But not everybody was happy with my decision, in case you didn't notice. <laughs> it's important in Washington to keep a sense of humor. You just need to accept that politicians need to evaluate everything in terms of the immediate political impact. And then there are the mercenary critics who get paid to express passionate opinions about every topic with little or no information at their disposal. They don't just express disagreement. They launch ad hominem attacks, unrestricted by truth or morality. They make threats. They spread fake stories. They even attack your relatives. I saw one of these professional provocateurs at a holiday party. He approached me very politely. He said, I'm sorry I'm making your life miserable. And I said, you do your job, and I'll do mine. His job is to entertain and motivate partisans so he can keep making money. My job is to enforce the law in a nonpartisan way. That is the whole point of the oath that so many of us have taken. In our department, we disregard the mercenary critics, and we focus on the things that matter. As Gertha said, things that matter most must never be at the mercy of things that matter least. A republic that endures is not governed by the breaking news cycle. In fact, some of the nonsense that passes for breaking news today would not be worth the paper it was printed on if anybody bothered to print news these days. One silly question that I get from reporters is, 
Is it true that you got angry and emotional a few times over the past two years? Heck yes, didn't you? <laughs> Last week, a big topic of discussion was, what were you thinking when you stood behind Bill Barr at that press conference <laughs> with a deadpan expression? <laughs> the answer is, I was thinking, my job is to stand here with a deadpan expression. <laughs> I'd like to stand silently at a press conference for 20 minutes, but can you imagine if I did anything other than a deadpan expression? Imagine the reaction, the commentary, if I had smiled, grimaced, or fidgeted during the press conference. So of course I invited the criticism. Why did you look expressionless at the press conference? And the answer is, that's exactly what I was going for. So then they asked, why didn't you blink more? I said, weren't you supposed to be listening to Bill Barr at the press conference? That was kind of the whole point. But you cannot avoid criticism. The only way you can avoid criticism in public service is if you stay home. But somebody has to actually do the work. And therefore, you need to accept that the criticism comes with the job. But all of that nonsense, I believe, quickly fades away. The principles are what abide. America's founders understood that the rule of law is not partisan. In 1770, five Americans were killed after British soldiers opened fire at the Boston Massacre. The soldiers were charged with murder. Many people believe that they deserved the death penalty. John Adams agreed to represent those soldiers. His political beliefs were firmly opposed to his clients, but Adams felt obligated to protect their rights under the law. Defending British soldiers was a very unpopular cause, to put it mildly. Adams faced a serious risk, and I'm reading his own words from his diary, of infamy or even death. In a diary entry about the trial, he wrote as follows. In the evening, I expressed to Mrs. Adams all of my apprehensions. That excellent lady who has always encouraged me burst into tears. She was very sensible of all the danger to her and her children, as well as to me, but she thought I had done as I ought and she was willing to share in all that was to come and place her trust in providence. That rhetoric mirrors an earlier letter that Adams wrote to explain his preference for integrity over acclaim. He wrote that in theaters, the applause of the audience is of more importance to the actors than their own approbation. But upon the stage of life, while conscience claps, let the world hiss. Adams endured harsh criticism in the theater of public opinion, but in the court of law, he secured the acquittal of a British captain and six soldiers. And at that trial, Adams delivered a timeless tribute to the rule of law. He said, facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of the facts and the evidence. Adams' words remind us that people who seek the truth must avoid confirmation bias, Truth is about solid evidence, not strong opinions. A 19th century Philadelphia doctor remarked that sincerity of belief is not the test of truth. Many people passionately believe things that just aren't true. Now, I spent most of my career prosecuting cases in federal courthouses. My past trials in courts of law contrast with my recent tribulations in the halls of Congress the channels of cable television, and the pages of the internet. The difference, as my US attorney colleagues know well, the difference is the standard of proof. In my business, we need to prove facts with credible evidence. We need to prove them beyond any reasonable doubt, and we need to prove them to the unanimous satisfaction of a jury of 12 random citizens. And you know how hard it is to get 12 random Americans to agree on anything. Pursuing truth requires keeping an open mind, avoiding confirmation bias, and always yielding to credible evidence. The truth may not match our preconceptions. The truth may not satisfy our hopes, but the truth is the foundation of the rule of law. If lawyers cannot prove our case in court, then what we believe is irrelevant. But in politics, belief is the whole ballgame. In politics, as in journalism, the rules of evidence do not apply. 
That is not a criticism, it's just an observation. Last year, a congressman explained why he had decided not to run for re-election. He said, I like jobs where facts matter. I like jobs where fairness matters. I like jobs where, frankly, the process matters. He was describing an American courtroom. I like the art of persuasion, he said. I like finding 12 people who have not already made up their minds, and they may let the facts prevail. That is not where we are in politics. That congressman spoke the truth. It may never be where we are in politics. I'm not sure it ever was where we were in politics. But it must always be where we are in law. Attorney General Jackson spoke about the fiduciary duty of government lawyers, the obligation to serve as a trustee for the public interest. He contrasted the special duties of government lawyers with what he called the volatile values of politics. Now, this was in 1940. Jackson understood that lawyers must at times risk ourselves and our records to defend our legal processes from discredit and to maintain a dispassionate, disinterested, and impartial enforcement of the law. We must have the courage to face any temporary criticism, Jackson urged, because the moral authority of our legal process depends on the commitment of government lawyers to act impartially. Now, Jackson also spoke about the role of lawyers in preserving liberty. He used a parable about three stonecutters asked to describe what they are doing. The first stonecutter focuses on how the job benefits him. He says, I'm earning a living. The second narrowly describes his own personal task. I am cutting stone. The third man has a very different perspective. His face lights up as he explains what his work means to others. I am helping to build a cathedral. Whether we're aware of it or not, Jackson explained, we do more than earn a living. We do more than litigate individual cases. We are building a legal structure that will protect human liberty for centuries to come. As my time in public service comes to an end, I encourage each of you to keep that cathedral in mind. You're always building a legacy. You set an example for your colleagues, and you lay a foundation for your successors. Time flies when you get to work with good and honorable people, as I have for the past almost 30 years. In the words of an eagle song, I'd do it all again if I could somehow, but I must be leaving soon. It's your world now. Use your time well. Be part of something good. Leave something good behind. It's your world now. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening means a great deal to Lisa and me. Shak Chinorgalam, Yev Pari Kishere. Thank you. And good night.